It is the 19th of January 2017 and TV news crews are filming a building on fire. It is an iconic landmark of the Tehran skyline, once the tallest building in Iran. But firefighters are battling the flames and the building has been evacuated. Normally steel frame buildings are fairly resistant to fires, thus although it's going to be a costly event, tragedy might be preventable. However, one of the floors near the top of the building collapses followed by a total building collapse just half an hour later, all of which was caught on news TV. Today we're looking at the Plasco building disaster. My name is John and welcome to Plainly Difficult. Background. Now before we start, I am pretty sure a video about Iran has never appeared on this channel so today is somewhat of a novelty. However, even thinking about it, we did slightly cover Iran during the Q80 oil field fire video, but I'm not sure if that really counts. The country is an interesting one. I remember watching a video from C90 Adventures that went through Iran, and it seems like a really beautiful place, but sadly, not somewhere I'd probably ever visit. But our story begins way back when Iran was much more friendly to the West, especially compared to how it is today. This is Tehran, the capital city of Iran, and in the early 1960s, a new tower block is being constructed. The owner behind it is Habib Elkanian, CEO of a company named Plasco, the company's biggest plastics manufacturer. Habib is a self-made millionaire, developing his company from 1959. The building marks an interesting time for Iran when Western influences were much more prevalent under the last Shah. The building, named after Habib's company, Plasco, is actually two buildings, a 16-storey high tower on the southern side and a five-storey high structure on the north side. Although combined, it is known as the Plasco building. The tower was the tallest building in the country when completed in 1962. Although having 16 storeys, only 15 were above ground, giving it a height of 60 metres from street level to the top of the structure. It had a steel frame with beams in the basement, the main columns were steel boxes with cross bracing. The floors were concrete slabs mounted to open web steel joists. The exterior of the building had a steel crisscross facade, which I suppose in the 1960s looked modern, but personally I think it looks a bit grim. I do have a bit of a soft side for 1960s design, but not this. So the building was designed to withstand gravitational loads as well as longitudinal loads, as you would expect, but vitally for our story, no real fire protections, thus leaving the important structure vulnerable. The building would see a real big change over the horizon as the 1960s turned into the 1970s, and opposition to the incumbent government was boiling away below the surface. Now, I'm going to quickly pause here and say I'm not going to go too deep into the history of the Islamic Revolution in Iran, but what I will say is the revolution was not good for the Plasco building's owner, Habib. You see, he was a prominent member of the Jewish community in Iran, and had reportedly financed his building with investments from Israel. Shortly after Iran's regime change, he was arrested in March 1979 face trial under the charge of corruption, contacts with Israel and Zionism, as well as economic imperialism. He was tried and found guilty on the 8th of May and executed by a firing squad the following day. The bloody end of Habib would result in his family's money and property being confiscated by the new Islamist government, including his famous Plasco building. In 1979, the Plasco building was used as a shopping centre with offices in the upper reaches of the tower, but with the confiscation, the complex would get new usage. The Islamic Revolution, Mostazafan Foundation, now occupied the building and rented out each for use as both residential and commercial space, with much of the commercial space being used in the textiles industry. As the years went on, a number of attempts to modernise the building's fire-resistant qualities were tried. But resistance came not from fire, but the tenants who refused to allow the costly retrofitting work to be undertaken. On top of this, the building's owners didn't really have the money available to do the work, and thus the building stood with virtually no centralised way to stop and contain a fire. And now the stage is set for a deadly day in 2017. 
Before we get into our collapse part of the video, let me show you a story I found on Ground News about a more recent structural collapse. That will probably be a future video subject. Ground News is a tool that can help cut through the confusing world we live in, where we are subjected to the rapid spread of hard to verify information through social media, echo chambers created by algorithms and filter bubbles, and financially incentivized click generating news pages. Ground News was created by a former NASA engineer and will help guide you through the complex media landscape we found ourselves in. And it does this by gathering related articles from more than 50,000 sources around the globe. This allows you to see how the same story is reported at different outlets and importantly, their political biases. Take a look at this story where a canopy collapsed at New Delhi Airport killed one and injured six during heavy rain. It has been covered by 161 news sources, with it being reported more on the centre and left, 47% of the sources being in the centre and 32% leaning left, over 21% leaning right. If we scroll down, you can see all the news articles, their factuality rating and their lean on the political spectrum. This article from the National Post is very descriptive, whereas the BBC one is is a lot more blunt. You can see the story is being reported on the middle left of our political spectrum today. I for one find this really useful when researching for videos as ground news allows me to get a fuller picture of an event. It works for me as an important tool for thinking critically and not just following one side of the political spectrum and taking a more balanced account of events. What I really like is the blind spot feature, which allows you to check for stories that you may not always see due to having strong political biases either way. And if this interests you, and I think you will, go to ground.news slash plainly difficult to give it a try. If you sign up through my link, you'll get 40% off the Vantage plan, which is what I use to get unlimited access to all features. I think Ground News is doing important work, and I hope you'll check them out. Right, now let's get back to the video. The Disaster It is the morning of the 19th of January 2017. There are tours being conducted around the building today, and as always workers are busying themselves in the garment factories. At roughly 10 minutes to 8 in the morning, a fire breaks out on the 10th floor of the tower section of the Plasco building, on the northwestern corner. I know other reports have said it was the ninth floor, but bizarrely the building's actual floor numbers were different to how they were labelled in the building, because for some reason level 4 was omitted. It had reportedly been caused by a short circuit in a workshop. Workers in the area attempted to put out the fire themselves, but it didn't work. Eventually, firefighters were called to the tower, and upon arrival, they quickly began evacuating the building. There were no fire extinguishers or sprinklers in the tower, and by the time the firefighting works could begin, 20 minutes after the initial call, the 10th floor had already been enveloped with smoke and flames. The fire was fierce, with it spreading up to the floors above, by the stairway shaft. Nearly two hours after the fire began, the 10th and 11th stories had been relatively controlled, but the flames reignited. The fire was exposed to the building's 11th floor unprotected webs and bottom cords of the trust type members, severely weakening them, and reportedly causing the concrete floors to show signs of deformation and deflection. Roughly three hours after the fire had begun, the first of three collapses of the tower happened. This was floor 11, internally failing on the northwest corner onto the floor below. The second of the three parts of the collapse was in the same northwestern corner of the tower. This was floors 12 and 13 falling down onto floor 10. Needless to say, this was putting excessive strain on that 10th floor. At 11.02am, an order was sent to the firefighters to evacuate the building and continue firefighting operations from the outside. However, the only escape route was via the main staircase, which during the fire, in some locations, had experienced localised collapses. Thus, some firefighters and civilians were trapped inside the blazing building. The building was still standing, but not for much longer. Understandably, the collapse and fire had attracted a lot of attention from locals and news teams. At 11.33am, the southeastern section of the building experienced a progressive collapse and within a matter of seconds, the building had fallen, crashing down into the streets below. 
As soon as the dust settled, firefighters who were outside the building frantically started searching through the rubble, trying to find their colleagues who were still inside. Thankfully, the building was largely empty at the time of the collapse. At least 70 people were injured and taken to hospital, but sadly, at least 20 would die in the building, and the majority of which were firefighters. It would take up to nine days before the final remains of the building's victims were recovered. The city was flung into mourning, with tens of thousands going out into the street for the full emergency workers' funerals. But the biggest question on most people's minds was, how did the building collapse? Which leads us on to the next part of the video. The Investigation In the aftermath, a national committee was created to investigate the collapse and all regulations, procedures and actions by the authorities in charge. The committee also had subcommittees to study the collapse from various different aspects, including the technical, legal and social economic. Quickly, the fire source was found, and this was a short circuit in some dodgy wiring on the 10th floor. The wreckage was poured over, footage of the collapse was watched, and importantly interviews from survivors would begin to paint the picture of the failure. As steel buildings, buildings don't often collapse during fires, the design of the building would be a good place to start, and its unprotected open web designs of the floors would prove to be a vulnerable point. Investigators found that the intensity of the fire was in excess of 600 degrees Celsius, and it was enough to soften the unprotected steel of the floors, which caused them to fail, pulling column C1 towards the inside of the building. This caused the southeastern side of the building to fail progressively, which then pulled the rest of the building down with it, with columns B3 and C2 being the last to fall. Now, the building's owner was Tazafan Foundation, issued an apology four days after the disaster. And although the owner, they claimed they weren't involved in the day-to-day -day running of the building, and thus the fire wasn't their fault. They committed to replacing the building, which would open in 2021 under the name Plasco 1400. However, claiming lack of responsibility doesn't mean that they weren't responsible. As reported in the Tehran Times, the investigation team would put blame on the building's owner. The report, found that the owner of the building, Mostazafan Foundation, had been negligent in the face of warnings by authorities on the possibility of disaster, noting that enforcing regulations by the owner and municipality had been possible in the Plasco building without affecting the businesses. Interestingly, the report was applauded by President Rohini for its results as it was considered apolitical and independent, which I suppose can only be a good thing. The disaster highlighted the poor state of fire resistance for many buildings in the country. But sadly, that's no solace for those who passed away. So it's scale time. It's going to be a four, and this is what I've got for the bingo card. Do you agree? Let me know in the comments below. This is a Plain Difficult production. All videos on the channel are Creative Commons Attribution Share Like Licensed. Plain Difficult videos are produced by me, John, in a currently very warm corner of Southern London, UK. I have a second YouTube channel, and Instagram and Twitter, so check them all out if you want to see other bits and pieces of what I get up to. And I'd like to say a very, very big warm thank you to those of you who financially support the channel on Patreon and YouTube memberships, as well as the rest of you for tuning in every week. And all that's left to say is thank you for watching, and Mr. Music, play us out, please. <laughs>